Amen. All right. Well, we're there um, in Ezekiel chapter 18. Just keep your place there. We're going to start off the sermon um, in Ezekiel 18 in just a minute. Um, but first this evening, I want to tell you a story. I want to, this is a true story. Um, and the reason I want to start off with this story, this story is not the, necessarily what the entire sermon is going to be about, but I believe it will help set the stage for the sermon, kind of uh, get us into the mindset of what we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, but like I said, this is a true story, so we'll go ahead and get started. On May 13th, 1945, it has been five days since the end of World War II in Europe, and a man named Wilhelm Keitel was arrested by Allied, Allied forces. Wilhelm Keitel was known as the Oberkommando de Wehrmacht, or in English, the Supreme Commander of the Armed Forces for Nazi Germany. He was arrested because he would face trial for war crimes committed during World War II, he was tried at the International Military Tribunal at Nuremberg, more commonly known as the Nuremberg Trials, with 21 other previous Nazi leaders. Now, not all these 21 leaders were charged with all four counts, but the four counts that the trial focused on were as follows. Count 1, conspiracy to commit crimes against peace. Count 2, planning, initiating, and waging wars of aggression. Count 3, war crimes. And Count 4, crimes against humanity. Now, like I said, not all 21 defendants were charged with all four accounts, but a few of them, including Wilhelm Keitel, were charged with all four of these counts. And you say, okay, well, what does this have to do with anything? Well, the title of the sermon this evening is called The Nuremberg Defense. Nuremberg Defense. I'm going to define what that means for you. There's an article that kind of explains it that says this, quote, Superior orders, also known as the Nuremberg Defense, or just following orders, is a plea in a court of law that a person, whether a mil member of the military, law enforcement, or the civilian population, should not be considered guilty of committing crimes that were ordered by a superior officer of official. So basically what that means is the Nuremberg Defense, as it has become to be known, is this legal plea in a court that basically says, Yes, I committed the crime, but I am not guilty because I was ordered to do so. So, for example, this would be like if, um, say, you stole a car and you're arrested. I know we use this during soul winning a lot. But say you stand before the court and your plea is not, oh, I didn't steal it or that's not true, but rather, well, a police officer came up to me and he told me to steal the car. Whether or not that was true or not, but that's what, that, that's what this would be. This would basically be if you are charged with a crime and your answer is, well, I was ordered to do so by someone who had authority over me. Okay, and you, there's something that made the Nuremberg trials unique. What, what that was, almost all of the evidence that was presented against the defendants in this case was not witnesses. So it wasn't like they, the, the prosecution would put up someone behind the witness stand and say, I saw this guy do this, or I saw him kill these people. What made it unique is almost all the evidence was German records. It was German records that showed you know, who was given an order, orders that were carried out, the numbers of people who were um, ordered to be killed. And what's interesting about it is that these men, not all of them, but a few of the men, including Wilhelm Keitel, their legal defense was not, that's not true, or I didn't do that, but rather, I was ordered to do so. I was just following orders, and so therefore, I'm innocent. And this is what became known as the Nuremberg defense, okay? One article says this, quote, during the Nuremberg trials, Wilhelm Keitel, Alfred Jodl, and other defendants unsuccessfully used the defense. They contended that while they knew Hitler's orders were not, were not lawful, or at least had a reason to believe they were not lawful, their place was not to question, but to obey. Okay, and what would end up happening is essentially the court would end up ruling against this defense and saying it was invalid, stating this, quote, the fact that a person, pay attention to this, the fact that a person acted pursuant to the order of his government or of his superior does not relieve him from responsibility under international law provided a moral choice was in fact possible to him. By the time the trial was finished, three of the defendants were acquitted, they were found not guilty, seven received varying prison sentences, and twelve, including Wilhelm Keitel, were sentenced to death by hanging. So the question, again, this, the whole sermon is not going to be about this story, but rather it sets the tone. So the question is, this decision that the court made, was it the right move? You had these men who had this evidence presented against them that was, ironically, their own military, their own government's documents and records, 
And they chose to take up the legal defense of, I was just following orders. And the court ended up saying, because of the fact that everyone has a moral choice between right and wrong, essentially, this is an invalid legal defense. So was that the right move, right? So what does the Bible say about that? You're there in Ezekiel 18. Look at verse 20. How does God judge situations? God is the great judge. God is the perfect judge. God is uh, a God in his throne. It is the highest court that man will ever face. Look at verse 20. The Bible says this, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Notice we're talking singular here. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the son or the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. So I want you to notice this whole chapter, we're not going to look at the whole chapter, but God, I want you to notice the theme here that God judges people individually. God judges nations as a whole, but people he judges individually. Look at verse 30. Therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel. Notice this, every one. Every one, according to his ways. Not their ways, but his ways, saith the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so your iniquity shall not be your ruin. See, God judges people, whether we're talking about salvation or even just in our lives, yes, it is true that our sin can affect other people and our sin can have consequences for other people and we can end up being harmed by being too close to other people who are in sin, but God still judges people individually. So this evening, like I said, the, the title of the sermon is called The Nuremberg Defense. And what I want to do this evening is I want to look at three, I want to give you three statements that nullify common moral loopholes. This is something, you know, a lot of times we accuse the world of being unfair and we accuse the world of, of which, which is true, the world does not have God, they don't have the Bible, they don't have respect to it. And so sometimes we can accuse the world of, of uh, not following morals through, but sometimes I think even us can sometimes get the following uh, ideas that, well, I'm innocent because of this, I'm innocent because of um, said moral loophole. So that's what we're going to look at this evening. Go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel 22. So I want to give you three statements this evening based on this idea that God judges people individually. At the end of the day, you are responsible for what you have done before God. The first statement I want to give you this evening is this, compliance is cooperation. Compliance is cooperation. Now I want to make this clear before we start. Obviously God has ordained authority structures in our lives. Okay, so obviously you are ordered to obey the authority structures in your life un unless they contradict the morals of the Bible. But, so what this means, or what this does not mean, is this, mean, this does not mean that if your boss tells you to do something you do not agree with, that does not mean that you get to say, well, I don't want to, I'm just not going to cooperate in that because I don't agree. No, you are, you are ordered to obey the authority structures in your life. And there's nothing wrong with you cooperating. If your boss tells you to do something and you think there's a better way, and you just do it, you're still supposed to do it the way he said. But when it comes to a moral perspective, if someone tells you to do something that is immoral, and you do that, this in, this in particular is the Nuremberg defense, you are responsible for what you have done. Look at 1 Samuel 22, look at verse 9. So the context here is Saul is running from, uh, or David is running from Saul. Saul is hunting him down. He has the evil spirit of the Lord upon him. And Saul is saved, okay? Saul is saved, but he has this evil spirit. He is backslidden. He is hunting David down to kill him, okay? So David, if, as he's fleeing, he ends up talking to a friend of his who is a priest. And David, or Saul comes to the spot later, and there's this man, this reprobate named Doeg, who ended up uh, essentially ratting David out. He, he told Saul and he lied about David. He lied about the priest. Verse 9 says this, Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse come to Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. That was true. Verse 10, And he inquired of the Lord for him, and gave him victuals, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. That's a half-truth. Okay. Look at verse 11, though. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest. These are the priests of God here. Okay. This is the king, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests that were in Nob, and they came all of them to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here, here I am, my lord. And Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired against me? Now, he didn't conspire against him. Okay, this was a lie. Saul's just mad that, you know, he's probably just, 
He knows he's friends with David, and he's just mad about it. He's not thinking straight. Thou and the son of Jesse, and that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait as it is this day. So you see, Himelech just doesn't understand. And Himelech's kind of in shock here. It says in verse 14, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law, and go without thy bidding, and is honorable in thy house? Did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father, for thy servant knew nothing of this, less or more. So basically, Himelech is innocent here, and he says, Look, I didn't inquire of God for him. He came through. I gave him food. I, I, I don't understand why you're after him. He seems like a great man. He's your son-in-law for crying out loud. But look what Saul does in verse 16. Then the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king said to the footman that stood about him, because obviously he's the king, he has his soldiers, his army with him, over whom he is in command. He says, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord. Let's just pause for a second. Legally, I want you to understand here, legally, Saul had complete authority to tell those men what to do. This was not, this was not like a situation like England where, you know, the king or the queen is just the head of state. They're just a ceremonial role. Here in this position, Saul was not only head of state, but chief of staff. He had complete authority in this government structure to tell those men what to do. He had, and what he gives them here is a direct order. But let's keep reading. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall upon the priests of the Lord. Why? How come? They were just given an order from from their superior. Saul could have, obviously with the mood he was in, if I was in those shoes, I would be like, oh, right, I guess if we we refuse to do this, he's probably just going to kill us too. They understood that they were obligated to follow Saul's orders. But here's the thing, though. They understood that while he was an authority, there was a greater authority they would have to answer to. Authority above Saul that said, Thou shalt not kill. An authority above Saul that said, The innocent and the righteous, slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. An authority that said, Devise not evil against thy neighbor. An authority that said, Strive not with a man without cause if he have done thee no harm. So here Saul, and I, just as a side note, I always thought this was interesting because I think we can forget how bad saved people can become sometimes. Especially Saul, he had the evil spirit of the Lord. Saul literally was to the point where he gave the order, a saved man, where he gave the order to kill all these priests. But I think it's interesting and I, I almost feel like you can see the line in the sand that, of that Holy Spirit where it wouldn't even let him go any further. Because notice, why didn't he do it himself? If he wanted them dead so bad, why did he... And you would think, he tells these men to do it and they refuse, well, he would just do it himself. But it's almost like there was something deep down inside of him that he couldn't explain that stopped him and said, you can't go any further than this. I just thought that was interesting. But notice there was another man who did not have that barrier of the conscience of the Holy Spirit. And the king said unto Doeg, Turn thou and fall upon the priests. He had no problem with it. And Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priests, and slew on that day four score and five persons that did wear a linen ephod. And Nob the city of priests smote he with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen and asses and sheep, with the edge of the sword. So he goes and not only kills 85 priests, but he kills all of their families as well. It's a terrible story. But here's what I want to ask you this evening. There will obviously come a day when God sets all wrong right, when God makes um, all things new, he, he, he straightens all the wrongs in this world. But when that day comes and everyone stands before God, including Doeg, is Doeg going to be pardoned for this because he was following orders? No, of course not. Turn to Exodus 23, verse 2. Here's what we need to realize in our life. Okay, obviously, you know, when we're talking about something like Saul or, you know, these men at Nuremberg, this is a, this is a um, very big situation. We're talking about the deaths of a lot of people. We're talking about, you know, Saul, who's a king, ordering, you know, almost 100 people to be killed. We're talking about high-level things. But we can do this on small scales, too. We can use this moral loophole to say, well, it's okay of me doing this. I know it's not really right, but my boss told me to do it or, you know, 
um, this authority structure in my life, the government told me to do this, it's the law, I have to do it. And we can sometimes use that to almost justify ourselves or, or an attempt to justify ourselves for our wrong. But we have to notice this evening that to God, he does not accept that. Say, it's what my leader told me to do. Or, or how about this, it's what my friends told me to do. Because again, this statement we're talking about this evening, the first one is compliance is cooperation. That's compliance to an authority figure or just to your friends, to your peers. Peer pressure. My, my friends told me to do it. God does not recognize that, okay? Exodus 23, 2 says this, Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. God says, I don't care how many people are doing it, I don't care how many friends of yours, I don't care what multitude or you are in that is sure of what's right. If you know what's wrong, you have no excuse. Compliance is cooperation. If you comply with something morally, you are cooperating in that as well. 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says, Abstain from all appearance of evil. And look, something to consider, and maybe this is the most applicable point of this, if you find yourselves, because we, we've all found, found ourselves in situations in life where we're being pressured by different types of people, friends or leaders or, or whatever it is, who are pressuring us to do wrong. We've all faced that. We all know what that's like. But you've got to realize this evening, if you keep finding yourself in a spot in life where you are repeatedly having to uh, make that moral choice, then maybe you just have some friends you're, you need to get away from. Yeah. Yeah. If every, you know, say you get... Um, a delivery job, okay, delivering packages. I'm not trying to beat up on Brother Edwin, but if, if you get a job delivering packages and you just notice that for some reason every Friday your boss gets in the van with you and says, go to the bank. And you go to the bank and he runs in the bank and he comes out with, you hear gunshots and he comes out with bags of cash and alarms blaring. And that's, you know, maybe you need to get a new job if that's like every Friday for you. Yeah. You know, maybe if that, that's, how, that's how you can, um, avoid getting in situations like this, okay? Abstain from all appearance of evil. Amen. Exodus 23, verse 7, I, I mentioned part of this verse earlier, but it says, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. Which I find interesting, because here this verse is saying, hey, don't kill innocent people, not a very hard uh, concept to understand, but how he prefaces that is by saying, here's how you can do this, by just staying far from false matters. That is how you avoid situations like this. Your friends. If your friends, you know, if you, if you uh, for some reason, if your friends are always trying to get you to do sinful activities or do wrong things, you know, if how you hang out with your friends is by, you know, mugging people on the street, maybe you need new friends. Okay, this is how we can avoid this, okay? As the saying goes, show me who your friends are, and I will show you who you will become. This is a very true statement, okay? God expects you to avoid putting yourself in situations where you're being led into sin, okay? And remember, again, based on the concept of this sermon, that God judges people individually. You are not clear, you are not justified from the wrong that your hand does just because you were pressured or ordered to do it. Turn to Romans 13. You say, well, I can't avoid this situation. I'm in a situation where, I, you know, it's, I need this job or I need this, you know, and, and you know, I'm just... Because look, that, that is true, you know, and we can't, you know, we're, we, we are always going to be around worldly people, right? We can't um, close ourselves up in a shell. You know, Paul says, if you want to, you know, we must need to go out of the world if we were going to avoid all the bad people in the world. So these, these decisions do have to be made, right? We're just talking about mitigating it as much as possible, but sometimes you can't avoid the situation. Romans 13, 1 says this, Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God, the powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. So here's what this means. What this means is you are obligated, it is true, you are obligated to obey those over you, even if you don't agree. Okay? But what it doesn't mean is that any human authority, human authority supersedes God, God's authority. Ephesians 4, 6, I'll just read it for you, says... One God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in you all. In Daniel 4, we won't turn there for sake of time, but in Daniel 4, with the story with Nebuchadnezzar, we see the phrases such as, the heavens do rule, the most high rule in the kingdom 
of men. There is no worldly power. Although God has instituted government and God has, has instituted these things for our society, there is no authority that supersedes the authority of God. And at the end of the day, we all will be accountable to God for what we did and whose rule we decided to follow. Ephesians 5, 6 through 7 says this, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Saying, hey, some people are out there to deceive you with vain words, so don't, look, don't link up with those people if you can help it. Don't associate yourselves with these people because the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience for these very things. Turn to 1 Kings 1. 1 Kings 1. So the first point this evening, we're talking about moral loopholes we as people tend to take. Compliance is cooperation. You are not justified from sin just because you were ordered or told to do so and you listened. But the second statement I want to give you this evening is this. Silence is solidarity. Silence is solidarity. What do I mean by that? Well, let's look at this story. So here, of course, David, he's reaching the end of his reign. He's older. It is nearing the point, and everyone knows that Solomon is the one who is meant to take the throne. You have one of David's sons, Adonijah, and Adonijah doesn't do what Absalom did in years past. He it's not a violent overthrow. He doesn't, you know, raise an army over, you know, decades of manipulation. Adonijah just kind of sees the opportunity, and he's like, I think I can capitalize on this. So he kind of quietly announces himself king. He kind of, you know, again, no violent overthrow. It's no, you know, but he kind of just, he, he knows he's not really supposed to do it, but he kind of thinks that he can quietly just make himself king, okay? Verse 5 of 1 Kings 1, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time. So technically David didn't say specifically, hey, like, don't take the throne without my permission. Why hast thou done so? And he was also a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah. This was David's general. And with Abiathar the priest, and they following Adonijah helped him. Okay, so just notice, notice here, though, the narrator, all, all it says these guys were doing was they were just following him. Okay, they were like... They were his friends, essentially. But notice the narrator of the Bible mentions that they helped him just by following him. Okay? Joab didn't go out in the street and announce that Adonijah's king and David's not king anymore. So notice the subtlety here. Okay? This is far different than what Absalom did. Verse 8, but Zadok the priest, so there's a but here, so there's a division here, and Benaniah the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei and Ray, and the mighty men which belonged to David were not with Adonijah. And Adonijah slew sheep and oxen and fat cattle by the stones of Zohaleth, which is by Engrodel, and called all his brethren, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. So, no big insurrection. He basically just has a fancy dinner party with his friends and calls himself king. Okay, so he's trying to kind of slip this, trying to pull a fast one here on David. Which, by the way, look at verse 10. But Nathan the prophet and Benaniah and the mighty men and Solomon his brother he called not. So, just a, a note here. It is always a red flag when you have people that are doing things behind the scenes and only inviting certain people, right? When there are when they're, when they're, when they're certain people that they, you know, they're, they're not inviting this person, they're keeping certain people deliberately out of the loop, that's usually not a good sign, okay? Especially in a church. Verse 11, Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign, and David our Lord knoweth it not? Look what he says here. Now therefore come, let me, pray, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel that thou mayest save thy own life and the life of thy son Solomon. Go and get thee in unto King David and say, and say unto him, Dis not thou, my lord of king, swear. So basically what happens here, I want you to notice the difference is that the people, the way that the, the Bible here is dividing the people that were loyal to David and the people that were not, we're not the people who fought against David and who didn't, right? The, the situation with Absalom was a little more clear. But it's rather the people who said something and the people who did not. The people who silenced, the point is, silence is solidarity, right? People showed, and the, the narrator points this out in these verses, that, that their loyalty, these people's loyalty to um, Adonijah in disloyalty to David was 
it's shown simply by what they didn't say. The people who were loyal to, loyal to David were proved their loyalty by telling him, by letting him know what was happening. In look at verse 41. Here's what ends up happening. And Adonijah, this is sort of a humorous story. There's definitely humor in the Bible. And Adonijah and all the guests that were with him heard it as they made the at an end of eating. And when Joab heard the sound of a trumpet, because David hears this, he hears that Adonijah is trying to do this, and so he puts Solomon on the throne, and he, he orders it to be announced throughout the city, and the city's cheering, the city's happy that Solomon is being made king. And he said, Adonijah, wherefore is the noise of the city being in an uproar? They're, they're still having their little exclusive dinner party here. And while he yet spake, so he's not even done talking yet, and behold, Jonathan, the son of Abithar, the priest, came. And Adonijah said unto him, Come in, for thou art a valiant man, and bring us good tidings. So their friend comes, and he says, Come on in, I bet you have great news. And Jonathan answered and said to Adonijah, Verily our lord the king hath made Solomon king. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him in Gihon, and they are come up from thence rejoicing, so that the city rang again. This is the noise that ye have heard. And he just keeps going on and on, which I just... I find hilarious. I don't know if he, if he was just trying to stick it to Adonijah, if he was just, you know, excited, but it's pretty funny. He just, he's really push, he's really digging it in. And also Solomon sitteth on the throne of the kingdom. And moreover, the king's servants came to bless our Lord, uh, King David, saying, God, make the name of Solomon better than thy name, and make his throne greater than thy throne. And the king bowed himself upon the bed. Verse 48, And also thus saith the king, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which hath given one to sit on my throne this day, mine eyes having seen it. Verse 49, And all the guests that were with Adonijah, no kidding, were afraid, and rose up, and went every man his way. And you say, well, okay, maybe that was a poor move of Joab and some of these cabinet leaders of David to hang out with Adonijah, but was it really a mark of disloyalty? It was so bad that to David, a chapter later, when David is giving Solomon instructions about certain people and his recommendations for what he should do with those people, that as far as this matter was concerned, and when it came down to David deciding who Solomon could trust and who he could not, it came down to those who said something and those who gave nothing but their silence. Silence to David was solidarity with his enemies. And look, I mean, think about it. Imagine if you were to go up to Joab afterwards. If you were to confront Joab and say, Joab, why did you do that? Why are you disloyal to David? Why did you do this act of treason? Joab would probably laugh and say, I didn't tell anyone he was king. I mean, I didn't attack David. I, I didn't even draw my sword. I was just there, he would say. But to David and to God, that in itself was betrayal. Imagine this, okay? I'm going to use these guys as an example because they're, they're sitting in the front row, okay? But let's say I'm, you know, resting one evening and I hear a noise outside and I hear a cluttering and so I go out in my driveway and I look at my car and I see Benjamin underneath my car stealing my catalytic converter, okay? Now that would raise questions in itself, okay? But obviously I would be like, Benjamin is guilty. Benjamin, why have you betrayed me, right? But what if I looked up and I just saw Edwin standing there? And I'm like, Edwin, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm, 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 just, I'm just standing here. I'm just, I, I didn't say nothing. I didn't tell him to do it. I'm just here. What would I think of Edwin? Would I, would, I, would I think it was just a coincidence? No. And so the idea, when we really think about it in our own terms, silence in, is solidarity, okay? There are situations in life where you are obligated, if you are loyal to your friends and you know someone who's going to do them harm, you know someone's going to hurt them, so you have an obligation to let them know. And the beautiful thing is we don't have to wonder about that, because, how to do that, because especially in a church, the Bible gives us a method for that. Matthew 18, right? So there's ways to do it. There's, there's people to talk to, okay? Leviticus 5.1 says this, okay? No, notice this. It says, if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing and is a witness. So this is someone essentially who is a witness to a, uh, a crime and is, they're, they're deciding if someone is guilty and they bring this person up as a witness. Notice this, whether he hath seen or known of it, so they're going to question this witness, if he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. 
What it's saying is that if someone saw a crime and they, you know there was no other witness and there's no one else to, who saw it and they bring someone up as a witness and that person refuses to talk, that person refuses to say, maybe not wanting to get his friend in trouble, it says that is wrong. That, that now he has done wrong as well. Okay. Now, obviously it's important to highlight that you know, there is a difference between doing this and being loyal and being a tattletale. Okay? There's a big difference. Okay? The que- I mean, the questions you have to ask yourself is, you know, hey, is this, you know, is this my place to, to mention this? Uh, you know, is this, is this something I should say? Well, ask yourselves these questions. You know, does it concern me? Does it have anything to do with me at all? Was I even supposed to hear about it? Do I have any authority over the situation? Is someone I, I personally know and I'm loyal to, are they, they going to be harmed in this situation? Right? These are questions to ask yourself. Because, look, being a talebearer is a big thing in the Bible, too. Leviticus 19.16 says, Thou shalt not go up and down as a talebearer among thy people. Proverbs 20.19 says, He that goeth up about as a talebearer revealeth secrets, therefore meddle not with him that flattereth with the lips. Comparing a talebearer to someone that flatters, which is obviously a big sin in itself. So we're talking about two very different things here. And it just, you know, it takes maturity and it, it takes wisdom to know the difference. But... You got to be careful because people will, will, will manipulate you both ways. There will be situations where you should say something where people will convince you not to. And there will be situations where you, sh- you should not say anything, but people will convince you to spread it and convince you to gossip. Okay? And, you know, I, for me, I think the biggest um, distinguisher here when, you know, you see, oh, my, I'm telling the people this thing, am I supposed to or am I being a talebearer? To me, the biggest thing you should ask yourself is it matters who you're telling. Okay, typically when someone is, there's something serious that needs to be said, something that needs to be mentioned to the pastor, mentioned to another brother in Christ, usually you can tell if it's, if it's gossip or if it's serious just by who they're telling. If they're going around the whole church, they're going to all their friends and they're telling everyone, that's probably just gossip, okay? But if they have one person who they say they need to know this, the pastor needs to be aware of this, then it's probably serious. Turn to Numbers 13. Numbers 13. This is important, especially in a church. You know, it's part of being loyal to your brothers and sisters in Christ in a church and being loyal to the pastor. You know, if you know someone's going around trashing the pastor or trashing another brother in Christ, lying about him, you should mention something to the pastor. You should mention something to your brother. Just out of loyalty for them. Because again, silence is solidarity. Silence is solidarity. If Edwin sees... Brother Benjamin stealing my catalytic converter, and he's standing there not saying anything, it's a really big sign that he's probably in solidarity with what Benjamin is doing. Numbers 13, look at verse 31. Here the Bible says this, But the men that went up with him said, So this is the spies went into the land of Canaan, and they came back, and you know their job wasn't to give their opinion. Their job was not to give a strategic uh, plan. Their job was just to report what it was like. And they came back and they lied about the land. And they lied to the people and they scared the people. And they said, uh, God can't do this. God, God can't deliver us from these people. We're not able to do it. But the men that went, went, went up with them said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. They go on and say, It's a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, scaring the people. And there we saw giants, the son of Anak, which came of the giants. And we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So some heavy exaggerating and some lying here. They were sent to do a job, and instead they came back, and they did the opposite of what they were supposed to do. Think about this. They were going to go in probably the next week. They, they had, the, they had it, all this time. They were going through the wilderness and complaining. They were almost there. They were so close. But notice there were two good men, though. And these two good men, Joshua and Caleb, they knew that this was a lie. They knew this wasn't true. But did they just shrug and sit in silence? No, they spoke up and they said something as they knew it was the right thing to do. Look at verse 6. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, and they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceeding good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord, neither fear the people 
of this land. So they go and they, they, they stand up for what's right and they say something. And notice they, they mark their loyalty to God by what they said. And the fact that they did not remain silent when they saw people slandering God's plan for them. And you know, the funny thing about this is, obviously the people, they still panic. They didn't listen to Caleb and Joshua. They actually threatened to kill them. And because of the people's revolt and the people's lack of faith, this is why God, um, why God sentenced them to 40 years wandering the wilderness. It's because the spies spent 40 days um, not doing their job in, in, in the land of Canaan. So he said, okay, for 40 years, you're all going to wander until every one of you die and your children will inherit the land. And obviously God, again, judging people individually, being a just God, he didn't sentence Caleb and Joshua to this in the sentence that, in the sense that they didn't die with them. They lived. They, they ended up being the only two that saw the land of Canaan. But notice, they still had to wander the wilderness with the 40 people. A, a reminder that our sin still has consequences for innocent people. They did see the land of Canaan, but it, God made sure to distinguish them, but they still had to go through that just because of what other people did. Okay, but notice, there wasn't, God didn't just by chance pardon those two people. The reason those two men only went into that land was because God, based on what they said and the fact they did not remain in silence, he said, these people are loyal to me. Amen. Silence is solidarity. So this evening we're talking about moral, common moral loopholes that we can all fall into. Compliance is cooperation. Silence is solidarity. And last this evening, turn to 2 Samuel 3. Vengeance is vigilantism. Vengeance is vigilantism. Turn to 2 Samuel 3.20. Second Samuel 3.20, look at this. <clears throat> so Abner came to David to Hebron. So the context here is that Saul has recently died in battle, and David has taken his rightful place as king, but there's still a few people of Saul's house that have been fighting against David and warring against David, but they're losing because God is with David. And Abner, who is the, essentially the general for the enemy, he's the general for um, what's left of Saul's house, he comes to make peace with David. He comes to make a treaty with David. So Abner came to David to Hebron and 20 men with him. And David made Abner and the men that were with him a feast. So David treats him well and they come and they make negotiations. And Abner said unto David, I will arise and go and gather all of Israel unto my lord the king that they may make a league with thee that thou mayest reign over all that thine heart desireth. So he says, you know, I'll, I'll go home to my part of Israel, David, and I'll, I'll convince the people that they need to follow you and and he's for David here, okay? And David sent Abner away, and notice this phrase, he went in peace. He went in peace. The war is over. He went in peace. And when Abner returned to Hebron, but here's the thing, Joab, the troublemaker Joab, back during the war, in man-to-man in -man combat, Abner killed Joab's brother, okay? But look, this was, this was not a prisoner. This was not in a time of peace. This was, in, this was a man-to-man -man combat in the war, and Joab wants revenge. Joab took him aside to the gate to speak with him quietly and smote him there under the fifth rib that he died. He murders Abner in cold blood. He says, for the blood of Asahel, his brother. And look, this would not be the only time that Joab did this, okay? He murdered Absalom, which that guy was a little more guilty, but he also did this with Amasa. Amasa was, had just recently been set as the new general over David's army, and, the, and he murdered him because he wanted his position. 1 Kings 2.5, you don't have to turn there, says this. So what does David say? What, what does David, here, yeah, Joab taking vengeance, right, and being a vigilante. What does David say about that? Because look, this is another tendency we can do where we can look at people and say, well, based on what they did to me or what they did, they deserve it. It's okay if I treat this person badly. It's okay if I do, I, I do, I kind of kick this person when they're down a little bit because they deserve it. I'm just getting back at them. That's what Joab did. Joab was getting back at somebody. What did David say, though? Again, this is David. He is speaking to his son Solomon many, many years later about what to do with Joab. He says this, Moreover, thou knowest also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me. 
and what he did to the two captains of the host of Israel, Abner the son of Ner and Amasa the son of Jether, who he slew and shed the blood of war and peace, and put the blood of war on his girdle that was about his loins and in his shoes that were on his feet. Turn to Romans 12. Romans 12. Later in the chapter he said, And the Lord shall return the blood upon his own head, who fell upon two men more righteous and better than he, and slew them with the sword. My father David, not knowing where wit, to Abner the son of Ner, captain of the host of Israel, and Amasa the son of Jether, captain of the host of Judah. So look, point being, vengeance is not a moral excuse to do wrong. Just because we think someone deserves it, look, they might, okay? Whether or not they deserve it or not, that's, that's not part of the equation here. Vengeance is not a moral excuse to do wrong. Look at Romans 12, look at verse 17. Recompense to no man. No man. Not just our, not just our friends, not just our enemies. Recompense to no man, evil for evil. Okay. You know, even, I believe this is even talking about reprobates. Obviously, we're to hate the enemies of God, and, and that, that's, uh, you know, I hate them, they hate thee, that's, that's in Psalms. But this is, this is in line with what Jesus said about the Pharisees when he said they were reprobates, where he said, let them alone, for they be blind leaders of the blind. Look, let them alone. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Oh, God will deal with everything one day. Amen. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, Notice this, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Look, this is hard to do, I understand. We've all had people hurt us and, you know, step on us, and it's hard and it's humbling to do. Because look, especially when we're given the opportunity to execute vengeance, we're given the opportunity to get back at someone. But avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For so doing, thou shalt, thou shalt he coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. See, God wants us to avoid situations in life. Because, you see, a lot of times when we have people do us wrong, a lot of times we want to get back at them, we want to do what they did back, do what they did to us back to them. But, we got to understand, many times that's what they want. You see, there's a saying that says the pigs like it when you roll around in the mud with them because then you both get dirty, right? People want, there's people who, who they feed off that. They feed on the, on the, you know, evil for evil for evil for evil. But what the Bible is saying is, you know how you can just break that cycle? Is feed your enemy, love your enemy. Don't overcome evil. Uh, don't, don't become, don't overcome evil with evil, but rather overcome evil with good. Revenge, it's, it's the human impulse that we all want to correct wrongs that were done to us. Right. And look, this was the joy of mentality. This was the joy of mentality of they started it, they did it first, he, 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 was, he, did, he did it first, I, I just was recompensing, I just gave him what he deserved. But look, and again, notice the coals of fire there, saying, it's saying, you know what, sometimes the worst the thing, if you really want to drive your enemy nuts, if someone hurt you and you really want to get back at them and you want to really do what's going to bug them the most, treat them well. And it takes maturity to understand that, but that is true. There's a saying that says this, there is no revenge so complete as forgiveness. Breaking that cycle when people, all they want is they want to, they want you to feed off this evil for evil for evil cycle of human avarice. It takes maturity to break the cycle and just forgive and move on. Vengeance is not a moral excuse to do wrong. Vengeance is always vigilanteism. Turn to Exodus 23. Exodus 23. While you're turning there, I'm going to read you a, a law to Deuteronomy. It's a very simple law that God put in his word, where he said this, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ox or sheep going astray, and hide thyself from them. Thou shalt in any case bring them again to thy brother. And if thy brother be not nigh unto thee, or if thou know him not, then thou shalt bring it unto thine own house, and it shall be with thee until thy brother seek after it, and thou shalt restore it to him again. So, a very simple law, just God just talking about his moral law here, where, hey, if you're going down the road and you see your neighbor's um, animal or property uh, that they have lost or forgotten, hey, Return it to them. Go out of your way to find them or return it to them. 
Um, if, if you don't know them or you don't know where they are, then feed it and take care of it until they can come back and get their property. Amen. Verse 4 says, Thou shalt not see thy brother's ass or ox fall down by the way and hide thyself from them, but thou shalt surely help him again to lift, lift him up again. Okay? Very simple lies. Okay, that makes sense. You know, I'm being a good neighbor and helping your neighbor out if, if, you see, uh, if, if you saw him come under some misfortune. But notice Exodus 23, which you're at. This is just two verses that address this topic, but in a very specific, different way. Look at verse 4. It says, If thou meet thine enemy's ox, or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him. Verse 5, If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee, that's more than an enemy, someone that hates you. Those are strong words. Lying under his burden, and thou wouldst forbear to help him, it says, even though you don't want to, you, you, you wouldn't want to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. And look, I want to ask ourselves this, this question this evening. Why, think about this, why would God have to mention this? He already told us, he already told us this law of, hey, if you see someone's ox or ass fall astray, help them, you know, take it back to them. But here's what's so amazing about the Bible, and it shows the perfect understanding of, of the nature of man in the Bible. Not only does God give us laws, do this, don't do this. But God knows we're going to break the laws anyway. So then he gives us laws because he knows our tendency to not want to follow them. Yeah. God says, hey, if you see your uh, neighbor's ox or ass falling out of the way, help them out. Do you know, which most people would want to help their neighbor out or help their friend out. But then he says somewhere else, he says, and by the way, even if it's your enemy, you do the same thing. Because he knows human nature. He knows how we work. He, and, and, and that's sort of what the sermon about, is about this evening. God understands our nature, and he sees all the ways that we attempt to mask our wrongdoing. Our excuses. This one here with the ox is a, is, is a vengeance one. Well, he's my enemy. He deserves it. He hates me. He deserves it. Vengeance is not an excuse to do wrong. Vengeance is vigilanteism. Uh, turn to Romans 14. Romans 14. Romans 14, it's the last place I'll have you turn this evening. Romans 14, let's sort of wrap this idea up this evening. Just the fact that God has to mention this. God has to mention these things. Hey, by the way, don't use this as a loophole for sin. Don't use this as an excuse to not follow you what I, follow what I already told you to do over here. Look at verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou sit and not thy brother? Notice this phrase, for we shall, this is talking about saved people here, okay? We will not stand before the great white throne because we are saved, Amen. but we will still answer for what we have done. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord. That's a long time. God's, God's going to live forever. Every knee. Every knee. Look, we apply that obviously to the unsaved and how every knee is going to bow, and that's true. But look, uh, and we, and I understand this is not under threat of going to hell, right? We will, this is, we, we are saved, but we will bow the knee to Christ. We will answer for what we have done. Every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Look, we're never going to go to hell, we're never going to lose our salvation, but in this life, we're still going to answer for what we've done to God. And again, we're going to answer to God for what we've done individually. Not as a group, not as a whole, but what for each, every one of us has done. You know, and, and I find this, this is, it, it shows the mercy in the, uh, of God, right? Because in verse 12, it kind of closes it out just to make sure we get it. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So the point of the sermon is this. God judges and pardons people one by one. There's no one else we can blame for our sin. And you know, I think, it's, I, I think it's interesting that this is how God works, that not just with us, but even to the point, just think about this, even to the point when there is a day that God will right all the wrongs of this world, and, and where the Bible says everyone will stand before God, all the unsaved people. Look, these are people already condemned at the great white throne judgment. They're already done. God doesn't need to give them an excuse of why they're going where they're going. They're being brought out of hell, and they're brought to stand before God. But even then, the Bible says in Revelation 20, 13, they were judged every man according to their works. 
the nature of God and the mercy of God to where even with those that are already condemned and without hope, they are not saved and they have lost their chance to be saved. They have already died. Even then, God will bring every person and every single individual, even though already condemned, will have a chance. I don't know how that works or how much time they're going to have for this, but every individual that has ever, ever, ever lived and died without Christ, even they will get to have a chance one-on-one -on -one with God where they will answer for what they have done. Because God judges everyone individually. And I understand that works obviously with them it's hell and with us it's chastisement in this life or loss or rewards. But we are not exempt from the chastisements of taking these loopholes to justify our sin. And look, especially as us, especially as saved believers, look, we live in a world out there where people, don't, people aren't Christian, they don't know God, they don't know the Bible, they don't care about those things. But look, let it especially not be said of us who are Christians and who do, do love God and do love the Bible that we use these moral loopholes just the same as the world to justify our wrongdoings. Amen. So in conclusion this evening, the bottom line is God judges us individually. Don't take these loopholes. Don't use the Nuremberg defense on God because he will see, he sees right through our human nature. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.